Uh, thanks, Bill, for that introduction. I think I'm going to go down a big Wikipedia rabbit hole tonight, um, Googling a lot of those concepts. Um, so a lot of you sitting here today will kind of have a glimpse of how difficult it is to build a deep tech startup. There's regulatory risks that you have to kind of navigate your way through. There's a depressed funding environment at the moment. And most of all, you're trying to will something that hasn't been created before into reality. So I'd love to start off by asking, with all these kind of difficulties in building deep tech, what gets you guys up out of bed every morning? Maybe we'll start with you, Mark. Yeah, thanks. Um, can you hear me? No? OK, sorry. Uh, hello? Mic check? Hello? There was a mic down here now. Do you want to switch to somebody else and I'll get my yeah, mic? Yeah, yeah. Maybe we'll start with you, then, Kenna. Yeah. Uh, basically, I. Um, what I, one of the expression I would use is uh, user experience. I'll explain what I mean. Uh, when I say user experience, I'm talking about everybody has a smartphone. Uh, and this smartphone, as you can say, changed the world. And a lot of the startups here, in some form or the other, wouldn't exist if not for the, um, the smartphone. So the smartphone and the base stations both use, uh, at the heart of them, is the radio. And the radio is made up of semiconductor devices. And that's what uh, um, we are creating an advanced version of these devices. Um, the, the thing is, with, without, um, um, if, 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 we, if we continue the way we've been doing, so the way the radios are built, uh, they've been this, built the same way since 1920s, uh, when Edwin Armstrong discovered the radio, or uh, invented the radio. Um, not, not a lot, in a broad stroke sort of way, not a lot has changed. So we're building them the same, same way. Um, and I'll get back to it, what, what it means to with the user experience. So recently I was, talking, I was pitching to an investor, and she told me that she has 5G, and it's much worse than what she, uh, 4G she used to have. Um, and obviously, technically, this is not correct. You know, 5G should be better than 4G. But in our case, she experiences differently, and that's what I meant by user experience. So uh, here we are. We build that uh, semiconductor device a certain way, which are part of radio, which is at the heart of the base stations and the, and the smartphones. And we have user, user experience that's not so great. So if we had to put all these um, in a cause and effect, uh, and you could draw a straight line. So that's what we're trying to change. And that's a pretty uh, powerful motivating factor to getting up on a bed every day. So. Yeah, and I think we'll double click to, into that a second, what it actually means bringing a little 5G into the world. Why don't we go to you next, Tom? Yeah, well, uh, thanks, Ashton. Uh, what gets me up in the morning actually is my alarm clock, usually, so I can go for a run with some friends that I run regularly with or to take my kids to uh, early orchestra at school on our, on our bikes. So that's what literally gets me up in the morning. Um, but the thing that motivates me and has done for the last 25 years is trying to build a quantum computer. So that's, that's what I, I've done in my research career, and it's what I'm doing now with my company, Analog Quantum Circuits, is trying to build the components to make uh, superconducting quantum computers uh, work. And so what I think about day by day is, you know, what's the next calculation I need to do to uh, solve some particular problem? Or what are we, when are we going to schedule the next fabrication run to, to make the next component that we're going to put in the fridge? Uh, and so building quantum computers and figuring out how to do that day by day in, you know, the, in the detail that it takes to engineer an extremely complicated system is what keeps me going. And we're going to explore that in a second with some back to the future analogies I hear. Um, Mark, what about you? When the going gets tough, what motivates you to kind of keep working in the field of discovering new drugs? Yeah, I think it's, um, can you hear me now? Yeah. I think it's um, keeping an eye towards the vision of where we're really trying to ultimately get to, which is really trying to condense all of chemical knowledge down into a very, very small, efficient agent that can perform uh, sort of hypothesis generation and testing for us. So it's a really a way of speeding up um, the, the scientific discovery process. And it's a lot of steps needed to get to that ultimate goal. So every morning it's, what's the next step? What's the next step? What do I need to do to get that bit closer? What do I need to do to enable my team to get that step closer? It's really that every morning thinking, what can we do today to get closer to that ultimate goal? I love that. And I think everyone sitting here will kind of have their own idea of what quantum computing means. Probably a lot of those things will maybe be wrong. I think everyone talks about the cryptography use case. We talk about defense. In your own words, Tom, what will it mean for the world when we get to quantum? 
Yeah, so, so quantum computing is a new paradigm for uh, doing computation. Um, there's, a, there's a global race on at the moment. Uh, lots of uh, big companies in uh, major countries and, and also companies in Australia are really working hard to build this new thing. It doesn't exist. Uh, it's a, a new thing called a quantum computer. And it's capable, when we have one, of running uh, algorithms, quantum algorithms, that are just not feasible to run on, uh, on ordinary computers. So it's a little bit like uh, you know, a car and a boat. A car is great for getting around land, but it won't take you on, on the water. So quantum computers are, are like that boat. You know, they they let, you, let you do things that an ordinary uh, computer can't do. And there's applications in cryptography that you, that you mentioned. Um, there's also uh, the possibility of simulating chemistry, sort of going to in the direction that Mark's thinking about. You know, Richard Feynman in the 1980s proposed that chemistry is hard to do on an ordinary computer because an ordinary computer can't do quantum mechanics. And we know that that's a, a computational problem. But we also know that if you have a quantum computer, it can simulate chemistry because chemistry is doing quantum mechanics. And so with, with, a, with a quantum computer, one can simulate chemis, uh, chemical processes, whether that's for medicine, medicine design, whether it's for fertil better fertilizers or, or catalysts or, or uh, making superconducting components for, uh, uh, for transporting energy over long distances. There's all sorts of materials problems that we could analyze with a quantum computer. And so that's the promise uh, that, that quantum computers offer. Is but, there one particular use case that excites you the most? Um, so actually, the, what we're working on at Analog Quantum Circuits is around superconductors. So I think a lot about superconductors. It's an amazing sort of type of matter where uh, it's a metal, metals or ceramics, which when you cool them down sufficiently cold, they conduct electricity with zero resistance. So that's, that's sort of a peculiar state of matter, but also potentially extremely technologically useful in the future. There's, there's use cases now, MRI, if you've ever had an MRI scan that uses a, a powerful superconducting magnet. There are mag maglev trains that people have built. Um, but if we had high temperature superconducting materials, we could, we could uh, transport electricity over extremely long distances with, with no, no losses. Yeah. yeah and as I understand it, like, without going too much into the science here, part of the microwave circulators that you are making, which are essential hardware for quantum computers, there's this concept that fascinated me, the concept of time reversal symmetry. And when you actually make these components, they break time reversal symmetry, which is very contextual to the topic of this panel. This feels like something out of a sci-fi film. Can you explain a bit for the audience what breaking time reversal symmetry yeah, is? Yeah, sure. Thanks, thanks Ashton. So, I guess there's a little bit of a prelude to that, which is what analog quantum circuits is actually doing. And we're making this, this component. It's called a microwave circulator. And it's not something that you probably are familiar with in your everyday life. But in fact, the mobile base station that your phone is currently talking to has dozens of them embedded in it. Uh, if, you, if you fly on a plane, there's a radar system that's monitoring that, where that plane is. So wherever you've got a microwave circuit that's, that's talking to the real world, there are these things called circulators. And they act like a one-way valve. So they're important for quantum computers because the, the interior of a quantum computer is extraordinarily cold. It's about 10,000 times colder than this room. And when I came in this morning, I'm from Brisbane. When I came in this morning, I thought this room was pretty cold. Uh, but superconducting quantum computers are 10,000 times colder than that. And just for some context, outer space, we think of as cold. It's about 100 times colder than the room. These quantum computers that, that we're working on are another factor of 100 times colder than outer space. So it's extraordinarily cold. And the reason for that is that it's got to be extremely quiet. There's got to be uh, insulated from the noise associated with the electromagnetic environment. And circulators are little valves that essentially isolate noise but allow us to communicate and control those systems. And so right now those things are about the size of a matchbox. We need about a million of them to build a large quantum computer, as Bill talked about. Uh, and so how do you fit a million matchbox size things together and integrate them. And this, is sort of, this slide is showing a little bit of what uh, a historical analogy that, that sort of explains where analog quantum circuits is, is going. If you look on, on, on that side, you can see a picture of ENIAC. It's a digital computer from the 1940s. And you can see the engineers plugging in cables to make it run. And that got shrunk to a thing that fits in your pocket. And the, the technology that did that was fabrication and integration. And that's what we need to do for these component circulators and other components. That's what analog quantum circuits is trying to do, is to shrink this superconducting uh, quantum computer onto a, onto a single chip. And those circulators do a special thing, which is break time reversal symmetry, which is a thing that only physicists could love. It's a bit of jargon. It doesn't mean we can go backwards in time. Uh, it does have sort of uh, 
uh, resonances with Back to the Future, if you've ever watched that movie. And the device we're making is a, is a re-engineered circulator, which uh, actually, if you're an electrical engineer, you'd say it's a, a, a flux capacitor. So if you remember the DeLorean in, uh, in Back to the Future, it, it worked on the, the flux capacitor. We, we're not going backwards in time, but we are breaking time reversal symmetry. Cool. And Tom, while you're breaking time reversal symmetry, Mark, in some ways, you're accelerating time, accelerating the time to discover new drugs um, with pending AI. Can you talk us through when pending AI is successful, what this will mean for the future of pharma pharmacology and medicine more broadly? Yeah, I think the, the drug discovery space is a very serendipitous area. It's a very expensive area, and there is a lot of failure due to this sort of cyclic discovery um, with, the, with um, sometimes in, in unknown new projects. It takes quite a while to build up that knowledge base. And so what, what's traditionally happening in the, the chemistry space in general is you will have a professor at the top of the sort of the hierarchy, then a bunch of postdocs, PhD students, master's students, all working very hard in fume hoods to run reactions. At the end of those reactions, it'll be condensed into a PDF and published in the scientific literature. And that'll happen all around the world. And then you'll also have very large organizations like contract research organizations that will do a similar sort of process, but at a much larger scale. So they'll have thousands of people working in thousands of human hoods. And all of this knowledge um, that is derived by humans in a, in a fume hood can be condensed and mined and then used to move forward to make predictions across the whole of chemistry. So we can take 100 million reactions, condense it down, and then we can ask this um, artificial agent who has understood everything in chemistry within a few hundred milliseconds or a few seconds, what would you do given this circumstance? What would you design? How would you imagine a molecule um, in this oncology space to look like? What would you imagine an agrochemical um, would look like or a smart material? So we basically, we stand on the shoulders of hundreds of thousands of people over the last century and a half that have contributed their data. We mine that data and then we shrink the time down from four to five to six weeks in a lab down to a few milliseconds or a few seconds on a pretty powerful server sitting in a data center. And that's the way that we're able to shrink that time needed to discover something new. Because we're going after search spaces now of trillions of molecules. So if you want to hire enough PhD students to search through a trillion molecules at six weeks a pop, it's going to be very, very, very expensive and take you a very long time. So we want to shrink that search space down from trillions to a few hundred in each project that we're going after and then we can switch back to, to human um, power um, in that last step. So that's really what we're trying to get to, to accelerate that discovery process and shrink that space down to be a manageable size. And for the kind of commercial minds in the room, mm -hmm. where do you think your first kind of use cases will be? My head's going to personalize medicine, that feels like a mega trend that this would fit under. What do you think the first use cases will be? We, we've really been... Um, very careful to not make narrow AI in the chemical space. So we're trying to make a platform, and this platform um, is going to get leveraged in a bunch of different projects, but we're, we're being very careful that we don't make the AI hyper-intelligent in just one field or just one project. So but I, do, I do think early-stage drug discovery is the most... Um, valuable, um, given the data set that we have. That's the trick that no one likes to talk about. The AI is only as good as the data set that it's trained on. And with medicinal chemistry, there are a lot of um, data that is available, that is very well curated, that is very clean, and we can mine that data very well, whereas other areas like um, natural product synthesis or other types of areas, sometimes that data like sort of smart materials, some of that data is hidden behind proprietary um, firewalls, if, if you will. So it's a little bit harder to get that data set. I, I think early stage drug discovery is, is, the, is the area that we will have most uh, early success with. It's extremely exciting. And we're going to pull our head out of chemistry back into physics again. 
with you, Venkata. And we're talking about this before, some of the impacts that 5G could have on society. We talked a lot about remote surgeries as one of the examples. What do you think is preventing this 5G technology that we've all heard about for almost probably a decade now from having the most impact possible? I think um, the industry has focused a lot on um, uh, unit economics, which is what the natural thing to do would be. Uh, but the reality was that we had to focus on uh, I would, what I would call system economics and also unit performance. Uh, let me explain a bit. Uh, system economics, by which I mean, if we look at it, the people building the base stations, which will make it all happen, are the telcos. And they're building the way they're building, not because you know, they're not trying to create ubiquitous coverage everywhere. They're trying to see based on the business case. And they will do what they can do within the fact that they have very little margins left over. Um, ultimately, and now they're going to buy the equipment from the uh, OEMs who make the radios, like Ericsson's and Nokia's. And they will make the way they've always made it, um, because you know, they're trying to not innovate too much to the point where they spend lots and lots of R&D money towards it. Uh, and the people who make semiconductor devices, like Qualcomm's, they keep doing the same thing as well. So all of this means that people are focusing on their narrow silo, uh, where they're focusing on uh, unit economics of how much it's expensive or how cheap it's going to be. So Qualcomm's keep thinking about, OK, we're going to make these chips really cheap so we can sell billions of them. Uh, but the downside of that is they, they neglect the performance adequately enough that the system um, economics starts to uh, spiral out of control. Uh, so that means that uh, we need to refocus back onto what the system cost would be uh, and uh, unit, unit performance. So that's what we're trying to do. Uh, do it in a way that um, the telcos can say, um, build this as a fraction of the cost, like a one-tenth of the cost. That would mean that um, uh, you know, the user experience I talked about before, you know, 5G experience, 5G being worse than 4G, that wouldn't happen. So that's going to require uh, completely rethinking the way we build radios and semiconductor devices. Um, and trying to improve things like energy efficiency, so which is what we're trying to do. So. Yeah, and I'd love to double click on that for a second because I think everyone here has had experience with 5G. They probably have it on their phone. If we're, it seems like we're at about 10% of what the capacity could be if we're using millimeter 5G, but the unit economics aren't working properly. If we're at 100%, what are some of the use cases that we could do with properly working 5G, if I can yeah. use that phrase? Yeah. Um, if, we, if everybody in the room thinks like they're a, a rock star brain surgeon, and you got called to do a surgery somewhere in a foreign country, and you had to fly there to do the surgery, and you're the only person in the world that could do it. And on the way to the airport, you, the flight got canceled, and the surgery is just reliant on you, no one else. Um, so if the millimeter of 5G reaches potential, what that would mean is um, you could go back home, uh, and then you could use your smartphone to connect to the network uh, of the hospital in a, a, on the other side of the world, and you could uh, control the, use the, open the app uh, on the smartphone and control the surgical robot to do the surgery. Now, that sounds pretty far-fetched, but there's actually been an experiment done that to demonstrate the value of millimeter of 5G uh, five years ago, where there was a uh, surgeon in Oxford University, and there was a banana on the other side of the world in California, and they operated on it. So the reason for that is millimeter of 5G enables low latency, um, so the time lag is very low. So this, this sort of kind of use case start to happen as well. Yeah, and I think, sorry, my, my mind keeps going back to commercial use cases. You mentioned the unit economics wasn't working before. Paint me the picture of how the unit economics may work five, ten years, and this becomes you know, something that's very commercially viable. Yeah, um, today if we were to build a um, millimeter of 5G network in Sydney end-to-end, -end, it would cost around the $25 billion over the lifetime of the network. Now imagine that there are uh, 40 cities, global cities, right? We're not even talking about uh, urban areas. We're just talking about the 40 global cities around the world. And if we built end-to-end -end millimeter 5G network, that would be like a trillion dollars. Uh, so nobody would want to invest that kind of money uh, to make it happen. And that's one of the reasons why it has slightly been delayed. So if we, if we are successful in, in developing these things and redoing the way the radio is built and improving the energy efficiency of the semiconductor devices, uh, it would mean that you could build a um, millimeter of 5G network at, in Sydney for $2.5 billion, a fraction of the cost. So it would be a 10-time uh, reduction of the cost. Uh, that would mean that the telcos would be much more uh, amenable to uh, try to deploy them, uh, and more people would be using them as well. It would become more uh, ubiquitous, let's say. And when I was thinking through kind of what's preventing all three of your companies from getting to market faster, like what's stopping the acceleration for time, 
my mind went a lot to misconceptions. Like we've seen the misconceptions of nuclear and what that's done to kind of the establishment of nuclear energy. What would you say are the biggest misconceptions that your worlds are facing or your businesses are facing and that we can kind of clear up in this room today? Maybe let's start with you, Tom. Yeah, okay, thanks. So uh, quantum gets used now. It's starting to creep into films and so on. So you, you hear it in, in, uh, in popular media and I, I still find jokes about cats dying funny, you know, as long as they're alive and dead. Um, but so uh, the, the problem with, with that, I guess, is that uh, quantum gets used as a sort of fix-all power-up that you've just put quantum in, in front of some other mundane thing in order to make it more exciting. Um, and, and that's not really what quantum's about. It's not making a generic thing exciting and, and interesting. What quantum does is to solve some specific problems we know, so around sensing, that is, collecting more accurate data. We know we can do that if we take advantage of, of quantum mechanics. That is, we could do uh, more accurate MRI, for instance, in medical imaging, or we can make better clocks to keep track of time, which is important if you're in a, in a GPS-denied navigation environment. So there are specific applications for quantum sensors that, that mean that they're going to be uh, useful in a way that, that conventional uh, technology won't be. And for quantum computing, it's not a case that uh, if just putting quantum in front of computing means you're going to go faster in everything. It doesn't mean you can cheat in your chat GPT assignment uh, faster than you would otherwise. What it means is you can solve some very specific problems, as we talked about them before, you know, around cryptography or around uh, chemical simulation. You can solve specific problems uh, more efficiently. And so I guess that's the message to get across is that there are specific problems that quantum mechanics solves. And if you're in a business where that's important to you, where they're getting better data or solving specific complex computational tasks, then it's something you should know about. Throwing the same question to you, Mark, what would you want everyone in the audience today to leave with in terms of a better understanding of accelerate, AI accelerated drug discovery? Yeah, I think the, the major challenge is actually the traditional medicinal chemists that are in the space that sort of have that feeling that uh, only humans can um, be creative. Only humans can come up with novel ideas and that anything a computer generates um, is substandard or is, is, not, is not truly novel. It's just um, adding A plus B to give uh, a known answer. So I think, I think um, enabling uh, traditional medicinal chemists to use AI to make themselves be infinitely more productive is the, the biggest challenge that we have. So we have a, a very traditional, highly intelligent, very skeptical audience that we are trying to uh, help and assist by, by giving them these sorts of tools. I think that's actually one of the biggest challenges that we have uh, in the AI adoption in this space. Um, but I think it's, yeah, it's, it's a very valuable um, tool to enable this because just the, the accelerations that they would get by, by uh, adopting such a tool. And then, Ken, I'll go, I'll go to you next. I think we've all heard the conspiracy theories about 5G on the internet. What's the kind of big misconception that you come up against the most? Um, I think there's a lot of videos explaining the element of 5G could be, um, you know, because radiation, it could be, it is dangerous um, in a way that's uh, harmful for health. And, and any radiation is obviously harmful for health. Um, it just depends upon the amount of radiation levels. That's why there's a SAR, uh, acceptable SAR levels and so on and so forth. Uh, but ultimately, uh, one of the things that's missed most of the time is that millimeter of 5G in the frequency spectrum is quite far away from the ionizing radiation. So the sunlight is closer to being the ionizing radiation than millimeter waves are. So being in the sunlight for too long is obviously not a good thing as well. And it can absorb water too, and so on and so forth. Um, so millimeter of 5G in a very, very high levels is obviously not good, uh, just like sunlight is. But it's nowhere near being an ionizing radiation. Uh, but generally, um, that seems to be a worry for a lot of people, even if that is not, it's not backed by science or facts. So. And, I, and I think everyone in the audience today is quite forward thinking. Everyone's thinking about, okay, these technologies sound great. You know, discovering new drugs, all the different uses of quantum. You know, that surgery example of a surgeon here operating on someone in a developed country. These all sound great, but how do we accelerate time on these use cases? And my, question, my last question to you all is, what do we need to do to get there? Um, I might start with you, Tom. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I guess what we're trying to do in, in analog quantum circuits is make the components that's going to allow uh, large-scale quantum computer makers, like IBM or Google or Amazon, large companies and also large startups, 
uh, to get there to, to build um, quantum computers. And so, you know, if in, in 10 or 15 years you're running a quantum computer, uh, I'll be very pleased if it's got analog quantum circuits technology uh, sitting inside it. Um, but I guess there's, there are people in this room who can help speed that up, and, and maybe this is a sort of call to action. I've got four different uh, people in mind when I'm, when I'm saying this. One, one is research institutions. So, you know, quantum technology is still coming out of uh, research institutions. It's still extremely driven by academic research. Um, and so, to, to people from research institutions is, make it easy for us to work with you. That's, that's the first audience uh, that I want to talk to. The other is, is government. So government uh, controls how a lot of the resources that have been invested in Australia and actually around the world uh, are used. Research uh, facilities like ANFF and so on, CSIRO, uh, it, it has the, the levers of power to make those things more, more effective. So if you're from government, what can you do to uh, speed things up in quantum technology, but also in, uh, in, in, in broader research intensive deep tech companies like many people here rep representing? If you're an investor, come and have a chat to me. Um, we, we're, we're always interested to meet, to meet new people. Um, and, and also, if you're in a sector that, that uses microwave uh, components, if you're in telecoms, if you're in uh, defense or radar, uh, civilian radar applications, or if you're building a quantum computer, come and have a chat as well, although I probably know who you are already. So. I love that you're ruffling a few feathers there. Um, I'll ask you the same question, Mark. Uh, yeah, some of the, some of the challenges that uh, we need to overcome. It, look, the, the data we're training on is um, it's biased. It's got a lot of anthropogenic bias in that data. So w when a person comes to work in the morning, they'll run a reaction, and they probably want to go home at 5 o'clock, so they'll probably want to stop that reaction at a certain time. That influences the data. A lot of the data we collect is around us, around what we're interested in. It's the regions of chemical space that are valuable. So um, there are certain diseases that aren't so common that the economics don't work out. Um, and those sorts of targets, if the price of discovery was lowered significantly, we could go after a lot more targets. Or we can go after targets that are much more difficult. So 85% of the proteins are considered undruggable or difficult to drug. Why don't we go after those by lowering the costs? And so it's really about lowering the cost to discovery, and then we can always make a business decision later on down that discovery pathway, whether we continue to invest in it or not, but at least we've had that chance to have a look at the, all those diseases that are currently undruggable. Um, because of the time, the capital that required, I think those are the sort of regions that will really unblock this technology. So. Yeah, I saw a few people nodding their heads and really resonate with what you're saying. Last but not least, Venkata, what do we need to do to get to a world where millimeter 5G is operating at scale? Yeah, I think uh, we are probably at a stage where uh, Australia still matters to us in the sense that um, uh, what the government policy here would be or what the, um, uh, the funding situation would be still matters. But I just want to take a step back and try to explain the heritage Australia has in the uh, intersection where we work, which is semiconductors and wireless communications. That's where we are right now in that space, in the intersection of those two things. Uh, CSR has a long his uh, history and tradition of uh, being excellent at these, these two, top two areas. Um, and in, in fact, without CSR, I probably wouldn't be sitting here today because we're funded through CSR's Wi-Fi you know, patterns. Uh, so from that, from that perspective, uh, there is a long tradition and history behind it. Uh, but as we go forward, though, uh, the, uh, there is this sort of narrative, I think, sort of unsaid in a way, but it's sort of there, that semiconductors are not really that critical in Australia because we're too small um, and, uh, you know, we just export, import them. And that is not really a, a, a good enough, uh, you know, scenario because of all the other considerations that are happening around the world, so on and so forth. Um, I think from that perspective, uh, the government policy could do a lot. Um, you, know, you know, I don't know the Productivity, Com Productivity Commission says that you need to focus on the things where you have advantages rather than trying to support everything. But the reality is that semiconductors have had a long history and there is a, um, a tradition of excellence in this country. And I think that's something that we should be encouraging. So VCs and a government could do that because they both influence each other. Um, so I think in the broadly speaking, that's something that could make a big difference to companies like ours because there's only two semiconductor companies that are funded in Australia. One is us and the other one is Moss Mike. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sachin, for leading that really interesting conversation on time.